Well, we spoke a little earlier about the busy day today at the U.N. General Assembly, and that included a talk given by Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He spoke about the failed system of capitalism and of the world conflicts and was critical, not surprisingly, of the United States and its allies. Meanwhile, Ahmadinejad's government is in the midst of carrying out a plan to severely limit the use of Internet in Iran. It would block Google and create its own domestic Internet network. Now, this is interesting for several reasons, one being that it was Iranian hackers who were behind several hack attacks of big banks here in the United States. That's according to an investigation by Reuters. Iranian hack hackers, they say, conducted multiple, uh, several denial of service attacks of the websites of Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase and Citigroup over the last year. Now, I want to talk more broadly about some of the repercussions of what's happening in Iran and what the threat of cybersecurity attacks by Iran could mean for the U.S. Joining me now is Tim Carr, Senior Director of Strategy at Free Press. So, Tim, let's talk first about what's happening in Iran. The Iranian government says, you know, they're, they're doing this, they're blocking Google to increase cybersecurity. Uh, but others say the ban is uh, connected to the anti-Islamic video released on YouTube recently. Uh, how does this play out? Well, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting to note that, you know, the first real or first well-known instance of a cybersecurity threat actually occurred when when we hacked into an Iranian system and the United States placed a, a worm uh, in their nuclear facilities that uh, that disrupted their centrifuges and so uh, so this does have precedence and and so it is playing out you know Iran has come after us there is of course this video uh, which has it has inspired instances of, of censorship you know Pakistan has shut down YouTube Iran is now shutting down Google and other other means for people to get access to this so this is all playing out and it's been playing out over several years now I think it really became heightened during the Arab Spring when we saw a lot of people using the internet for political purposes as far as this apparent hack attacks on the financial sector, um, uh, apparently those behind it say they carried it out in retaliation for sanctions put on Iran. Uh, to what extent uh, do we think that this could continue, more hack attacks from Iran? Um, I'm not sure that, we're, it, that it is as serious a threat as a threat coming from other places. I think you'll, you'll see uh, in the United States that the, the president is weighing in an executive order that would give the administration more control over what they call critical infrastructure to shut down systems in case of a, uh, a, a cyber attack. And I think what the real concern there is, is is with Iran to some extent, but also with China. China has had, there have been several instances where Chinese hackers have gotten into business systems, into government systems. Uh, and so there is this, this notion that cyber security threats are coming from all sectors right now. And, and the fear, is that our government will overreact in, in putting down clamps on the internet, taking control of what they call critical infrastructure, like the network, whenever there is this perceived threat from the outside. And, and we have to make sure uh, that, uh, that they're telling us the truth, that these threats are real, because the internet is an important tool uh, for people to do good things as well. Absolutely. And, and you bring up this executive order. Certainly parts of this um, coming from the president's office have been uh, released or, or leaked out. Uh, and the reason for it, of course, is because Congress has not been able to pass any legislation dealing with cybersecurity. They almost got through SOPA and PIPA earlier this year. Um, that, of course, got voted down after several uh, major websites like Wikipedia uh, staged Internet blackouts that really got people angry. Um, certainly, it also has made uh, lawmakers like Senator Joe Lieberman come out even stronger than before uh, in favor of the need for immediate cybersecurity legislation. I want to uh, show you a letter that he wrote uh, to President Obama just this week. He says, the danger is real and imminent, yet we have not acted to defend against it. He says, we know our adver adversaries are already stealing val valuable intellectual property and exploiting our critical infrastructure, those systems that control things like water, electricity, transportation, finance and communications. Therefore, I urge you to use your, your executive authority to the maximum extent possible and to defend the nation from cyber attack. I think you bring up a really good point, Tim, uh, that, that we don't know everything that's in you know, the executive uh, order here and that um, it's possible it could go too far. What are people like you and others you know, in the cyber communities around the United States, what are, you, what are your concerns? Well, our concerns are exactly that, that it will go too far and cut into our, our, our civil liberties and, and, and censor speech and, 
and uh, and make the internet a, a massive surveillance system that uh, that can be shut down on a whim. And so so there have been a number of attempts. There was kill switch legislation, which uh, which had been proposed uh, a while back. It never actually made it to the floor. That was killed in a furor of of controversy and outcry from the internet freedom community. And then, as you mentioned, we had the PIPA and SOPA legislation, which was which was killed as well. There has a, there is a bill called CISPA, Cyber Information Sharing and Protection Act, which has passed uh, through the House. Uh, Senator Lieberman has a Senate version that the White House seems to support. I don't think we're going to step moving anytime soon, especially given the political climate with elections coming up. But there is a real interest in Washington and amongst a cy very powerful cybersecurity industry to push this kind of legislation forward so it would allow them to take greater control of the internet and importantly to kind of profit from the sort of government contracts that would come out of a heightened level of cybersecurity. And Tim, when you talk about the, the fear being heightened as well, I want to put up on the screen for you uh, from the financial services sector, they now have a sort of a threat level uh, that, they're, uh, that they've put on their website. And, you know, the cyber threat levels, um, you know, they're, they're showing it. And, and, you know, in some cases, I, I think this week it was uh, elevated or, or even up to, to high. So it's really interesting. I remember uh, back in the days after 9 11 we used to do this uh, around Washington DC you know the, the threat level today and how it's different now we're talking about cyber threat levels um, it, it's just really interesting because that is something that could get people uh, sort of riled up and perhaps even enough to rally behind more stricter legislation but let me switch gears Tim and talk about the future of the internet and the question which is a question a lot of people want to know is who will govern it uh, the U.S. made pretty clear this week that it would not surrender control of the Internet to a United Nations agency. Um, but, but how do we move forward here? How uh, do world leaders sort of navigate this question? Well, uh, we move forward uh, to use a somewhat wonky U.N. term by creating some uh, sort of a multi-stakeholder environment where these sorts of decisions about who governs the future of the internet are not decided by governments. There's a proposal that's going before the IT, the International Telecommunications Union, that that, that actually uh, is supported by Russia and China and other governments that would allow this body to take control of the internet in ways that we may not like. And the problem we have with any of these sort of top-down ideas is that they don't take into consideration this vast and now politically engaged internet community that has a say as well. So anytime there is an attempt to govern the internet in this way, they have to do it from the bottom up and allow those of us who have been very engaged in the issues of internet freedom and free speech to have a say as well. Certainly, uh, it seems that all parties involved here are working from uh, a place with no precedent. So uh, they're all sort of swimming in these murky waters together. Tim Carr, Senior Director at the Strategy of Free Press, thank you. Thank you.